On March 29th, 1889, William Kemmler, known affectionately by the locals as Philadelphia Billy for his constant drunken state, took a hatchet and killed his lover, Matilda Tilly Zeigler. He was sentenced to death. Given that several high-profile executions by hanging had been notoriously botched at the time, a new method of execution was in high demand. American inventor Thomas Edison saw this as a chance to publicly defame a rival electricity company's patented alternating current by showing just how dangerously it could be applied in his new invention, the electric chair. Kemmler was strapped into the very first electric chair before a sizable audience of reporters, government officials, and the developers of the chair itself. He was blindfolded before being shocked with 1300 volts for 17 seconds and pronounced dead by the attending physician. And so it seemed to all, until the physician noticed a small cut on Kemmler's hand, still steadily bleeding, a clear sign of life. As the audience screamed and some fainted, Kemmler's groaning grew louder and louder and the doctors clamored for the current to be switched back on. Oh my god, this man is still alive! Why isn't it still- Why isn't it turning on? Turn it back on! The chair finally restarted, sending 2,000 volts arcing through Kemmler who had gone as witnesses would later report, rigid as iron. This horror only stopped when the blood vessels in his face burst and his body smoked, filling the room with the distinct odor of burnt meat. Thomas Edison was a famous American inventor who is often remembered as the paradigm of perseverance. He's perhaps most famous for his development of the electric light bulb, a process that required countless hours and many more failures. But was Edison's approach to success, merely trying over and over again, truly a viable avenue towards triumph, or even a practical mechanism for coping with failure? Today we're going to look at two stories that argue the contrary. Two people of many that find that the key to success is not merely perseverance, but perception. Ask yourself what it means to succeed as we delve into these two American lives. This is Luis Barahona. Luis is a Spanish three teacher at Woodbridge High School and the boys JV lacrosse coach. Are you happy with where your life is now? Uh, yes, I am. I, uh, uh, if you could ask me when I was growing up that I would become a teacher, I'd laugh. And then I got into coaching and I liked helping uh, athletes and uh, I got a co my first coaching job. Uh, my athletic director said, what do you like to do? And I said, I like helping kids. And uh, he goes, anything, graduate anything with Spanish and you'll get hired anywhere. And that was uh, the beginning of uh, my call to becoming a teacher. Okay. Uh, looking back, what would you consider to be the biggest failure in your life? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, maybe not going to Michigan University or Loyola Marymount University, like big marquee name schools, instead of going to Cal State Fullerton to play soccer. You know what I mean? Uh, looking at sports instead of the actual education aspect of it. Okay. Um, your uh, soccer career, why didn't you uh, pursue a, a professional or semi-professional career in soccer? Because I knew my realistic abilities, I was realistic about, you know, my goals and also the money aspect here in the United States was not there, was not there. So I, I knew that in order to make decent money, uh, you needed to uh, get an education. We asked him what he thought his greatest setback was. He told us about his high school soccer experience, how his future seemed pretty much set on a path to a semi-pro career. This all changed when he suffered a devastating knee injury. What happened was I uh, I tore my ACL and then uh, I became used goods according to like coaches and that's when I started realizing that uh, you know you're pretty much one injury away from from your soccer career and you had to to find other avenues. You know what I mean? So that's how I. That's when I started to realize this happened when I was 19. So better get better early than later, right? 
And um, how did this failure contribute to where your life is now? It just made me realize that... Your perspective on... Just anything can happen. And uh, you gotta live life to the fullest. I mean, we're all on borrowed time. We never know where we're gonna go. You know what I mean? So that's how it is in sports. I mean, one day you're on top of the world, the next thing you know, an injury sets you back. You never come back the same way, you know, uh, depending on the injury, you know what I mean? And uh, and and you just gotta have realistic goals and realistic uh, aspects of, you know, what the worst, what's the worst that can happen? You know, be prepared for that. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who's struggling with failures right now? Uh, you know, uh, if you don't learn how to fall, how do you know how to get back up? You know what I mean? You can't take one failure from keeping you from achieving your dream. You know, it's, it helps build resistance, helps build character, uh, and it helps you shape, it helps mold you into the person that you want to be. You know, if you can take the punches and get up from the punches, you know, then Imagine it. I guess, the, I guess the, the way I can say it is, if you think this is the lowest point in your life, then you should live a happy life for the rest of your life. Okay, so uh, considering all the hardships that uh, you may have went through earlier in life, uh, considering that once again, we're going to ask you again, you're happy with where your life is now? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Berhona. Okay. Thank you. You could please introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Shinju Kang. I'm a Korean American, and uh, I've been here for 20 years. And uh, hi, Colette. <laughs> I'm mother of Colette and Emil at Woodbridge High. I'm a homemaker and writer. Okay. Are you happy with where your life is now? Yeah, I'm extremely happy. Um, very, very satisfied with uh, uh, the way my life is right now. Very grateful. Uh, but, but at the same time, I'm uh, going through a grief, so it's a difficult time, but the contact month is on the line. Okay, um, what are some hardships that you faced uh, in recent times or in the past? Yeah, uh, there are so many <laughs> that uh, it uh, was hard to, uh, in fact, single out a few because uh, the hardship that I had uh, is uh, um, I, uh, because I traveled a lot, and as a single person, I lived in different countries. So uh, I was in uh, I grew up in Korea, and I left my home when I was 26. I went to Israel. I studied there for four years. I went to Paris uh, three years, and then I came to America uh, at UC Irvine to to do some research. So. Uh, just uh, the fact that I moved from one continent to another, like so I lived in four continents as a single woman. So I had to, and being an Asian, I had to deal with a lot of racism, sexism, not on, on top of it, also financial problems, because I uh, had to, a lot of times I had to support myself, and uh, the pressure to finish my degrees. Those are all uh, hardships, and uh, so, uh, and then, in fact, those are the hardships that really gave me a lot of lessons about the failures and success. So what is your perspective on failure? Uh, I think like uh, when you uh, toast the idea like, oh, Shinju, I would like to interview about uh, success and failure, I thought it was a joke. <laughs> and I thought you wanted to interview me about failures because, you know, like, I'm a very happy person, and but then I I don't, uh, I'm not necessarily associated with the notions of success or failures because I'm a homemaker. So it's a very meaningful job. A lot of people don't think it's a, it doesn't have a social status. So uh, I was already surprised that you asked me uh, if I could be interviewed. And I think it also uh, reflects your own approach to success and failure because I think uh, you didn't look at uh, my social status uh, uh, as uh, in the so in terms of social criteria, so uh, you ask. I think you are looking deeper into it, and I think uh, maybe I agree with you because I think a failure is a perception of a, a state, which is a very difficult state obstacle. 
but I think uh, failure itself, uh, like there's objective state where something didn't work, your dream do, uh, does not come true, and uh, your objective is uh, like uh, has failed. So those are objective situations where you you have a failure. But then I think how you perceive is also uh, you know determines whether you are failure or success. And a lot of times throughout my life, I think uh, I had a lot of obstacles, a lot of failures, many. Like my life is failures ridden and failure food, you know, so much failures. A lot of times like what didn't work out, the dreams didn't come true and I had to uh, change my plans many times. So those are all small uh, obstacles and small failures because they didn't work out the way I wanted. But at the same time, I didn't have a uh, much sense of failure because my perception was different. Maybe it has to do with my faith uh, that like everything will work out fine, and I knew that uh, if something doesn't work out, that will also that that situation can be a stepping st st stepping stone to a new adventure, new opening. So the perspective uh, I had was already uh, uh, I think uh, um, uh, providing me the with a mindset that I could be happy. No. Okay. How do you think um, this? How do you think this <laughs> attitude has contributed to where your life is now? Mm. Ah, yeah. It's, uh, uh, to have this positive attitude and also to know that uh, uh, failures are just one instance that uh, you have to overcome, go around, or sometimes ignore. You just have to have the right response to each and uh, every uh, failures. And I think uh, what contributed to my current happiness is really, really crucial because when uh, I was, before I got married, I was very career driven. I studied feminism and it was my goal to go back to my home country and to teach, to be a professor and to teach. I wasn't interested in marriage. I wasn't interested in romantic relationship. In fact, I left home not to get married and to have a, to study was to have a, some kind of legal status, to stay single without uh, you know being pushed to, into marriage. So uh, so career driven. So when I uh, met Eric, I was very confused because I fell in love with him at the first sight, and I, I I was the one who proposed to him. But then I created a mess. It was a major change in my life. What do I do? You know, I cannot go back home. And then uh, I got married, and I got uh, I was. Um, I got pregnant, and, and then I did not know what to do. You know, like what do I do with my old dream of becoming a teacher and to uh, teach young uh, generation? And, and what about my feminism? You know, but at the same time, the experience of uh, pregnancy was a, a very huge uh, spiritual one. So I decided. Uh, another thing is, uh, uh, we don't we don't have any other family members in America, and Eric is from Belgium. So if of us working, uh, we are not going to have any family, you know, it will be too, too difficult for us to have a sense of community as a family. So we decided that one, we will we'll be a single income family, we will just face the poverty and uh, then we will just raise our children. So that's what we did. Now, so there are two elements, like poverty was easy to deal with, I, poverty was uh, enjoyable in a way, you know, so like I had uh, all this uh, a band in Irvine, Dirties and Oldies, you know that, right? My band. So it was it was enjoyable, you know, how many times in your life you have the Oldies and the Dirties car in town. So those are things okay, but then what about my career? What, what do I do with my life? And uh, so, but then I started writing. It's something that I never thought I would, because uh, I, I was uh, interested in uh, critique, uh, criticism, but then I turned to uh, writing and I started writing essays. And, uh, and I worked very hard. Uh, I started when I was nursing Colette. And so uh, fortunately, I had uh, two books published. And about uh, teaching younger generation. So, uh, 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 so I, and then also I had a brief chance to teach uh, in Korea for, for uh, a year. So it's, uh, I think, uh, uh, my dreams have been modified drastically, but nothing was really given up. And I think it's, uh, that's why it's so fulfilling because it's more, much more fun, fun than I, uh, I envisioned. You know, a lot of things that I thought I would do didn't work out. But uh, when I 
decided to cooperate with my my fate, it worked out well. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And lastly, uh, do you have any advice for those struggling right now with their own failures? Mm. Uh, I'll say, uh, look at life as a fun Mario game. You know, you don't you don't get all the points. Sometimes you miss, and sometimes you get, and you just hop and move on. And that, as long as you live, as long as you breathe, you know, you're not going to stop to death. If you humble your standard, or if you just work very hard, and, uh, and if your dream is uh, too unrealistic, like when something that doesn't work out, you fail, you fail. maybe it is, um, you had, you, it could be that you had an unrealistic dream. If you, everybody stick to their own old dreams, like 95% of boys will be firefighters. So, or present of America, and it will be so sad, you know. So dreams are there to be uh, to be modified, I think. So I have a uh, like dream. I don't know uh, romanticize. I don't uh, glamorize dream itself. Post your dream, but also be realistic. And I think you have your own part. Like if you work very hard, and when it doesn't work out, then it's great because you eliminate one factor. It's not your fault. So you you. When something doesn't work out, okay, I did my part and it doesn't okay. I wish it, did, it, it worked, but it doesn't okay, fine. So just have some kind of uh, distance from what you do. And I think that's very important, like hard working, being committed and to being dedicated to what you do is very, uh, but also to be resilient. When it doesn't work out, be very realistic and have assessment and you know, just uh, just be cool about it, you know. And, uh, one thing, I, uh, when before, uh, the, the most difficult time was when I was in Korea when I was nine, uh, 21. And I think it was before I learned any lesson in my life. That was a tough time because I wanted to study art and my parents couldn't uh, support me. Uh, and then we, my father was a professor but we didn't have a lot of money. So I, I felt uh, really hopeless. I, uh, and and uh, at the same time we lost money and so there was absolutely no way that I could go study abroad and then I had a pressure to get married and uh, so what I did was uh, even though I did not know what was going to happen I filtered I made money and I saved I had like a very thick uh, bank account money. and then when uh, the chance to go to Israel came up I could persuade my parents with my money here is a bank account you know here's the money that I saved so somehow I under respect from my parents and yeah, so um, about, the, about advice, I uh, would say uh, work hard and when you do something, do wholeheartedly. If you study or if you painting or dancing, just wholeheartedly. And then when it doesn't work out uh, the way you want it, then be resilient, be, associate, be creative. Do something, you know, that you can do out of it. And uh, so I think uh, basically your life will be a lot of failures. But at the same time, you'll have equal number, uh, number of uh, successes when you cope with your failures. So I regard myself a failure full and successful. You know, it's just uh, even. You know, and then as uh, just basically, as long as you look at these things with a certain perspective, and then you are the pilot, and I think it works out well. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas Edison thought perseverance through adversity was the key to success. Yet, as evidenced by the electrocutioners who killed Kemmler, merely trying and trying again isn't all there is to it. Not only did they fail to kill Kemmler with the first shock, as had been intended, but they continued on even when it was clear that an alternative method would have been far more effective. The experiences of Mr. Barona and Ms. Kang also serve to show that perseverance alone is not always enough to triumph despite failures. In the case of Luis Barahona, when a career-ending knee injury kept him from pursuing his dream of becoming a pro soccer player, he turned to coaching and found a new passion in helping others achieve their own dreams. Had he chosen to stay his original course and pursue a pro career despite his injury, he would have found himself severely disadvantaged by the stigma such an injury carries. He credits his satisfaction with his current life to his ability to adapt to the life-altering events that transpired at this critical moment in his soccer career, despite his initial frustrations. Luis Barahona now finds greater fulfillment as a mentor and teacher than possible had he continued to pursue a goal that had become, all of a sudden, far too unrealistic.
Shinju Kang found herself suffocating in restrictive Korean culture, and dreamed of running away to live abroad and become a literary critic. She traveled the world, enduring sexism, racism, and an almost ever-present lack of funds for her journey. Throughout her travels, she encountered many opportunities for failure, chances to give up and go home. And some might argue that she did, but not in the way that most would expect. In a sense, Shinju did give up her dreams of a mobile life as a critic when she got married and settled down, but she hardly sees this turn of events as a failure, as others might argue. So you see, rising from failure doesn't necessarily constitute perseverance alone, but also the ability to recognize when your approach to success is not only flawed, but unrealistic. It's harsh when you realize you can't achieve your dreams anymore. And though, in some cases, people with extraordinary effect can achieve seemingly impossible goals, but sometimes it's necessary to take a reality check and adjust accordingly. Trying and trying again can be seen as admirable, but at some point, it becomes foolish. And abandoning an unrealistic dream isn't necessarily a failure, but rather the first step in pursuit of a new, potentially even greater dream. And so concludes this week on This American Life.